Good morning, mule skinners. Yep, I'm out camping. Yep, this is my camp right here, as you can see. It's kind of unique. Yeah, a place called Kauai, Hawaii. I had a friend invite my wife and I to come over and spend a few days suffering with the temperatures right now of 73 degrees. Anyway, happy trails. Hope you enjoy the video that Dave has put together today. It's going to be pretty awesome. He always puts together some good stuff. So happy trails to you. Hope you enjoy the video. Bye-bye. Howdy, y'all. Welcome to Wednesday, September 14th, 2022. We're only going to get one of them, so let's make it a good one. As you can tell, I am not in the office, and I am not even in Arizona. I am in beautiful Magnolia, Texas, so all of my uh, Houston area Texas friends, shout out to you. I'm here today, and I'm getting to work with some friends on lots of fun stuff, and Steve is not in Arizona either. As a matter of fact, Steve and Susan are in Hawaii uh, celebrating living life and loving living, and uh, yeah, he's been sending me some updates, sending me some photos, and just really, really glad to have you here joining with us today. Uh, even though we're not able to be with you live, I've got something real special for you. Uh, we've been doing this show for multiple years now, and if this is your first time ever watching, well, I want to let you know the first thing that I want you to do is put your uh, let us know that you're watching, put your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather is like in the comment section. Uh, that way we can say hello to you, that way we can see that you are here, and that way other folks can reach out to you. That's the first thing. The second is that you ask any and every mule or donkey question that you got, and the next live show with me and Steve... We will get to those questions. And then the third thing is that you share the broadcast. That's the three things that we ask. And uh, we would love to hear from you, know that you're here. And we're so grateful that you're spending a little bit of time with us today. Today's show, like I said, we've been doing this for several years. Today's show is a replay of one of our most popular episodes ever that you probably never saw. It's a fantastic, uh, about one hour total episode from several years ago and uh, just a lot of really amazing questions were asked and as always Steve does a great job answering those questions so we're a little bit younger we were a little bit thinner but we were just as every bit excited to spend a little bit of time with you I hope you enjoy uh, this episode today and I want to let you know that you can go watch any of the past episodes on YouTube but more than that on iTunes or Spotify or Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, do a search for Mule Ranch or Queen Valley Mule Ranch and you'll find the podcast. And we've got dozens upon dozens upon dozens of episodes, just audio episodes, where you can go back and you can listen on the go. You don't have to worry about streaming video. You can download the episodes to your phone and uh, get a little bit more Steve Edwards in your life because who doesn't need that? All right, everyone. Can't wait to see you all live again real soon. In the meantime, enjoy today's episode. God bless. Hey, folks, it is Wednesday. So usually we've been doing these uh, Ask Steve Mule and Donkey conversations on Tuesday. Yesterday something came up and I said, Steve, do you just want to cancel this week or, or do you want to try to go on Wednesday? Steve said, by golly, let's do Wednesday. Let's make it happen. So here we are. We're making it happen. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing good. What I did Tuesday was go get my wife, and it was a little bit more important than talking mules. <laughs> a, a lot more important than talking mules, and I know that you're glad to have her back, and last week she was gone, and you had Jess right by you the entire time, so I'm sure Jess is glad that she's back too. Yeah, Jess is out right now, matter of fact, uh, catching balls with, uh, with Susan. That's great. Awesome. Well, folks, we're so glad that you're here. My name's Dave Shrine, and so I've been uh, working with Steve. I've known Steve for well over a decade now, and I've been working with him for a good portion of that, um, just doing all sorts of different stuff online. And so we're really excited to have you here today for uh, just talking about mules and donkeys. And that's it. That's really as simple as it goes. Um, if this is the first time you've ever been hanging out with us, and Steve, we've had a lot of new people join in for these live stream calls who um, who we've never interacted with before. So if we've got any people who have never watched before, uh, there's just a couple things that I want to let you know. Number one is uh, go ahead and post in the comment section where you're watching from today. It's always fun to see you know, how many continents people are watching from, 
uh, what the weather is like where people are watching from. So share where you're watching from and what the weather is like today. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, another thing that we want to do is let you know that you can ask any question that you want throughout the entire stream. And so we prioritize questions that come in live. So we go throughout Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and email, and we get all the questions that come in for Steve, um, and we bring them all here. But if you have a question that you ask live, that gets priority. Folks who are here live, we want to make sure that you get those questions answered. Those are the ground rules. And Steve, we've already got a couple folks sharing where they're watching from today. We've got Gloria Meyer, who has been on, I think, just about every single stream that we've done. She says, uh, Rex and Gloria are watching from Arcanum, Ohio. So hi, guys. We've got Absolutely. Linda Linda Kramer, who's watched quite a few of our uh, of our live streams. She says Linda Kramer watching from Springfield, Missouri, and it has been raining all week long. So I got a question for you, Steve. Being out here in Arizona and the infrequency that we have rain, do you like the rain or you dislike the rain? I love the rain. I mean, you know, the few times that we see it, uh, what's it been? Close to eight months since we've had any measurable precipitation. I know. Back when I had my cows, I needed that rain to be able to make that grass grow, you know, but I love it. I could not have a Seattle type atmosphere, you know, with the constant clouds and the rain. I like my sunshine. Yeah, I like my sunshine too. Uh, Tom, Tommy Payne says uh, Tyler, Texas, and it's raining out there in Tyler, Texas. Tommy, I have a friend out in Tyler, Texas. Believe it or not, I've been to Lindale and I've been to Tyler, and I love both of those. I flew into Dallas, and then I took one of those regional planes into uh, Tyler, Texas. Great town. Really cool to have you here. Uh, David Pagelli says, uh, Sonoa, Georgia, 74 degrees. How's it going, David? Good to have you here. The coffee man. That's the coffee right there. The coffee man. That's right. Sandy Ackley says, watching from Wickenburg, Arizona. Mickey Perini says, howdy from Ghent, New York, and uh, Gloria is going to get us started here with our first questions. But before we do that, uh, there are a couple more questions that I want to put out there for uh, for folks to answer. The first question that I want to ask, and then I'll get to a couple more throughout the stream. The first question that I want to ask is, and you all, you all can just type in this, we'll get to it, and then we'll go back and review, is what mule magazines, what mule and donkey publications, what equine groups what are your favorite resources, your favorite uh, places to go for mule and donkey information, education, photos? So please just go ahead and put that in the comment section. What we're going to do is we're going to collect all of those and we're going to share the most valuable ones, right? We're going to let folks know, hey, these are great places for you to go to get awesome resources on mules and donkey, of course, in addition to muleranch.com. So we'll get started here. So go ahead and share in the conversation. Um, what your favorite places for mule and donkey resources, whether it be videos, publications, um, groups, anything like that. So the first question that we've got comes in from Gloria, and she says, what do you use for flies on your mule's legs? Huh. Yeah, and it's really tough because a lot of these mules have uh, allergy problems when it comes down to fly bites, and they get really crusty, bloody, it's ugly. And, and you know, folks, what I, it's going, you're going to laugh, but I use WD-40. Uh, I, I, for a long time, I thought it was a fish base, and it's not. It's an oil base. But I bet you I've used WD-40 20 years easy. I have tried everything. You name it, all the new, all the brand names and things like this, and it just really hadn't worked. But I've taken WD-40. I sprayed it on a nice cloth. And I've, I've uh, rubbed it up and down the legs and on the chest. And it's an oil base. The flies don't seem to like it. And, uh, and I, so I can tell you that the ones that I have done, that, that because of the oil base, uh, it, uh, I think because it uh, has the oil base, that it even helped uh, the, uh, the flesh where, it was, uh, where, the, where the blood had caked up and stuff. Uh, I can tell you that the old cowboys told me a long time ago to use axle grease on uh, cinch burns and on breaching burns and collar burns. So I have kept around a little bit of axle grease here and there and rubbed it in places and it works good. And another thing I like to use, believe it or not, is baking grease. And that seems to work good. But WD-40, I put it on there and I rub it in really good, especially the ones that you have that have allergy problems and it works wonderful. Oh, by the way, a good friend of mine, Dr. Robert Miller 
a renowned veterinarian. He started using that on his meals years uh, years ago when I told him about it. And he said he just loves it. It works good. Now, I'm not saying spray it on. I'm saying spray it on a cloth, rub it on the leg. You'll do great. Awesome. That's a good one. Yeah, the we have a video up on YouTube. And in the video, you talk about how it being a fish-based oil well, um, or fish uh, – oil fish oil base and uh, folks were awesome they said hey just love the material thanks for putting out the videos just an fyi um it's uh it's uh it's not a fish based oil so we went we researched it we made sure that that's correct and sure enough it's great so i amended that video i said hey update on the video thanks so much to all of our watchers um and uh and it's fantastic stuff for people to check out so uh, we've got a couple more people chiming in we've got carla howe from uh uh, Loxley, Alabama, and she says yep. rain is coming. Uh, David Scholl says De Queensland, Australia. It's fine, sunny, and 92. So we've ah. gone international again. Thanks so much for taking us international, David. We love that. Uh, Eric Palmer says, uh, hey, guys, watching for a bit. So if y'all aren't following Eric Palmer, uh, make sure that you do. Fantastic guy uh, putting some awesome stuff out there on the Internet and uh, really connecting a lot of folks with great animals. So, and, and, uh, and Eric is a real donkey and mule trainer. It's not just, he doesn't just have, hey, I'm a mule trainer. You see on his videos, you watch him riding donkeys, working with donkeys, working with mules. Eric is really trying, and he, he's an awesome trainer. Yeah, agreed. So the next question that came in, and again, folks, we prioritize live questions. So I've got a list right in front of me. I've got my uh, I've got my laptop right here with all of the questions that have come in over the last week. Uh, but if you've got one that you want to ask live, we try to get to those as soon as possible. So the next one we have is from uh, Tommy Payne. He says, "I have uh, two Pecheron uh, Pecheron mules. How do you say that? Pertron. Pertron. Pertron mules um, that have that." Pull an old time covered wagon. What is the best driving bit for these guys? They are nine and ten years old. So, what do you have to say there, Steve? Well, if you know if they're nine and ten years old, they should be they should be very knowledgeable in the bit. So, my favorite thing is a a, uh, a bit that you can switch both ways. It is serrated on one side, smooth on the other, and it has a curved chain as well. And I had. Just lost the name of that bit. Oh, golly. Liverpool bit. It's, it's a Liverpool bit. And, uh, and here's the thing is how do we know if the mule, uh, likes the bit? Number one, anytime you put a bit in a mule's mouth, always let it hang down a little bit so that it's bumping the incisors or, or if it's a John mule's bumping the, the, uh, uh, the canine tooth. And what they'll do is they'll pick it up and pack it. They'll put their tongue all around. They'll do all kinds of things. And finally, they'll pick it up and hold it. And here's the key thing, folks. When a mule is talking to you, you'll know. When you see the nose go on the vertical and you see the head come down, they're starting to relax and starting to go. And it doesn't happen just in a few minutes. Uh, I, 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 I try to tell people all the time, don't just put a bit in the mouth and think, think boy, it's going to go. Don't do that, you know. Put the bit in the mouth, let the mules ask questions. Don't drive them, don't ride them, let them pick the bit up, put it down, pick it up, put it down. When they hold it in one place, make note of that. Make note of that. And then once you do that over a few days time frame, when that mule immediately picks the bit up and carry it, adjust it to that spot. Okay, but Liverpool bit, if if they're if they're pretty solid. And if they need foundational training, then double twist wire, full cheek bit. So hopefully that gives you the information you need there, Tommy. Throughout the entire stream, for folks who are new, again, welcome. If this is the first time you're ever hanging out with us, my name's Dave. This is Steve. And every week we come to you and just talk mules and donkeys. And it's a lot of fun. We enjoy ourselves here. Uh, but we answer questions that come in throughout the Internet. Uh, throughout the week from the internet and then here live. And so, uh, Tommy, hopefully that gives you what you need. I put a link to Steve's Liverpool bit in the comment section so you can take a look at that for reference, see what he's talking about there. Um, but as anybody else has questions, go ahead and post them. Uh, Eric just wrote back. He said, uh, thanks for your kindness, guys. Would like to hear Steve's thoughts on imprinting, handling, training baby mules that are being born all over right now. That's a big topic. What do you, what do you have to say there, Steve? 
I, I can tell you at one time, I said, I don't like this imprinting things. This is lousy. People shouldn't be doing this. And one of these days, I'm going to talk to that Dr. Miller, and I'm going to tell him just what I think about his imprinting garbage is what I told him. So I need to ask you real quick. I need to interject. What is imprinting? Imprinting is this. When the baby mule is born, then you start touching right away. And I even like to pull the placenta off and move it out of the way. And I touch, I put my fingers in everything. Oh, if I had to put a, a, a word meaning on imprinting, it's this. You're breaking and, and you, no, you are putting a foundation on flight because of fright. When that animal hits the ground, he's immediately a grocery store for any varmint that comes around. So they have to immediately have their feet on the ground and go. So imprinting is, is taking what's natural flight and flight, rubbing their fingers down the ears, and, and the mule goes, oh, well, you keep doing it. And then they relax. You pick up their feet. You touch them all around. You blow in their nose. You stick your finger in the end that you're not supposed to have your finger in. And things like that, you know, that's the basics of it. Uh, but Dr. M Robert Miller and I uh, uh, are now super friends. I've trained a couple meals for him. If I had to suggest books to go to, information to go to, go to Dr. Robert Miller, and he's a veterinarian, and look at his books. He took imprinting way beyond. A lot of other people have written about it over the years. But he took it and put it in simple words. He's written several books. He's got one book called uh, uh, Natural Horsemanship Explained. And what he does is he takes different clinicians and talks about them and says, this is the way natural horsemanship should look. And, and it's awesome. But that's what it is. And yes, I'm going to tell you, the better mules that I have trained on that have been imprinted correctly now, get this word correctly, folks. Just because you touch them everywhere and things like this, the big problem is this. People tend to let them into their space all the time. They're not allowed to come into your space. You go into their space. You pick up all of their feet. You take uh, an old towel and wipe them down underneath their belly, or around all of their private parts and stuff. And, and, and this sort of thing, and keep it up. And if the mayor tries to keep you away from that baby, tie her off someplace. Because some of these mayors won't let you around the baby. But the sooner you can get your hands on it, the better. But some of the better mules that I've trained on, including Dr. Miller's mules, have been the ones that have been imprinted correctly. And correctly is by the book that Dr. Miller's have got and his other DVDs, and that'll teach you. I went ahead and I found the book on Amazon, so I just added that to uh, to the comment section, so you guys can find it there. It's uh, Natural Horsemanship, Horsemanship Explained in the comment section, so if that's something you're interested in, go ahead, click it, get it, and, uh, and read it. Um, yeah, David might mention, yeah. that's Natural Horsemanship itself that is not imprinting. Okay. So he does have he does have a book and he has DVDs on imprinting. He has a lot of books. But the one on imprinting in particular, that's the one you should be doing. Very good. So uh, okay. we've got a couple more people who have chimed in. Uh, Howard Tucker from Carlisle, Kentucky. So, Hey, Howard. Yep. Hey, hey. Uh, we've got uh, Kevin Meredith. We've got, uh, Meredith. let's see, who else do we have here? Uh, Kevin Meredith. And I think that's, that's all the other comments that came in. So if you're watching, if you're just tuning in, would love for you to type where you're watching from and what the weather is like today, and then share any of your favorite mule and donkey resources, magazines, books, groups, places you go for uh, for video training, anything like that. We would love to see it. So the next question that I've got comes in from Linda Kramer, and it's about uh, it's about rain. So the first question, so Linda, I'm going to get to your question, but I have one that I wrote down that I want to um, that I want to get to. I just want to know, Steve. Why split reins? Why do we, you always talk about riding with split reins. Why split reins? Okay. Split reins, the, the right goes over the left and they cross and you hold it in the middle. All right. 
Why split reins? It's the safest way to ride. You see all the time people with one rein. That one rein is going to get you hurt. I have got clients that they let their mules get their head down and get a drink. The mule got his foot hung up in the rein. They flipped over. And that's not a pretty sight. Split reins, if, if you lose one rein, you still got another. But they cross, they actually end up being like one rein, but it's the safest way to hold, to hold on to reins. It's the safest rein to have. So now we'll go into Linda's question. And Linda says, what length split reins for a very short riding mule? 13.2 hands. She steps on the normal length ones. Cut them off. I like to have them come down uh, about to the knees. All right. That will be the longest I would like to have one. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, they make them basically uh, six to eight foot long. And usually six footers are an average, but uh, your your end that goes up and attaches to the bit, take them stupid snaps off. If you got snaps, Linda, you've heard me. You've been in my clinics. Take the snaps off. Either that or go home, take your spoon and tap on your teeth to see how good that feels, okay? But cut it off back where it attaches into the bit. Put your new loop, loop in it because a lot of your ends are thicker and heavier or have bats on them, but... Split range is the safest way to go. Great. So hopefully that answers your question there, Linda. If you have any follow-ups, uh, same with you, Tommy. If you have any follow-ups, feel free to put them in the comment section and we'll get back to them. Uh, Kevin Meredith gives us our next question. He says, what type of clippers are good to cut hair in the spring? I have two mules that would lose their hair uh, hair till mid-summer. So talk a little bit about that. Well, there's a, there's a lot of good clipper companies out there now. And I personally do not uh, clip my, my mules, my mules manes. I leave those manes alone. If you leave them alone, they'll flop over and they'll look really nice. I've had them from anywhere from, uh, 12 to 18 inches long up to about four inches long. Why do I like a mane? I can get a hold of that mane with my left hand, my right hand on the horn, and I get in the saddle. People who get a hold of the back of the cantle and the, and the front of the horn, Wonder why their saddles pull over. You know, it, it happens even on my saddles, you know. So, you know, your best way to do it is to put your hand on the horn, hand on the, on the hair and, and jump up. Have you seen people climb in my saddles and saddle not roll? Absolutely. Matter of fact, uh, Eric Palmer, he climbs in the saddle and the cinches ain't even pulled up, you know, to show people how well it does. But you pull hard enough, you're eventually going to come off. So you betcha. So there you go, Kevin. Uh, hopefully that uh, that answers your question. Again, if you have follow-ups, please let me know. So Tommy chimes back in uh, on his bit question. He says, so how do you know uh, the correct measurement? How do you measure a mule's mouth uh, to get the correct size bit? Therein lies the problem because a lot of mules are real fat-lipped on the corners. And so people are worried that they don't want to be touching the corners. What you need to be worried about is the jawbone. Here's the jawbone. You don't want it to be so long that it goes clear across the jawbone and doesn't give a good communication. You have to remember that the rings on the side are pushing against the face as well. If you have a too long of one, then it's going to give the wrong communication to the mule. And if you, if you got one that just touches the corners of the mouth, that's fine. Why do they get a strawberry on the corner of their mouth or get to bleeding? It's not from the bit most of the time because most of them are made right. But what it's from is the mule bracing against the bit, continually bracing. How do I measure it? I take and I take a, a rope uh, that's about as big around as my finger, about a 7 H rope. And I take a black marker and I mark, black, mark one side. And then I pull it up into their mouth. And then I mark the other side and I take it out and I measure it. If you have the Pertron mules like you're talking about, usually it's five and a half inches is the average bit that will work on that, that uh, Pertron. Great follow-up there. That sort of stuff, that's the type of stuff that um, a lot of times folks don't think to ask or folks don't know to, to look at. And so they kind of go at it and, and wind up not getting the results that they need. So that's a great follow-up question there. Uh, Kevin chimed back in. He says, I was talking mainly 
uh, about body clipping for uh, oh. for trimming. Any any thoughts on a clipper for body clipping? Well, you know, they got so many new ones out. Mine are about 25 years old. <laughs> I haven't body clipped one in a long time. Um, but there's a lot of good ones out there. My my old body clippers, they're about as big as this jug. They're huge. and But you don't need those anymore. These new ones are really great. They, they go pretty nice. But I can't tell you one particular, one over the other. There's there's several really good ones. So let's help let's help uh, Kevin out, guys. If you have a pair of body clippers that you absolutely love, uh, go ahead and type that out in the uh, in the comment section, and let's give him a few options that he can research and check out. Steve, you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I you know I want to tell you that the body clipper is only as good as the blade. So the better the blade, the sharper the blade. Just like a pair of scissors or a good knife, the sharper they are, the better they are they're going to be. I'm going to tell you, these new uh, clippers and stuff that they have, they're pretty awesome. They're nothing like we had 25 years ago. But I haven't showed her anything for since 2002, so I couldn't tell you where to start. So I've got a pretty nebulous question next, but I'm going to ask you because I want to hear what you have to say. So Howard Tucker, uh, his question is simply, how do I ride a mule? And I think that's the way a lot of people would start off. How am I supposed to ride this thing? So why don't you give me, I think this will be, I think this will really make well for YouTube. I would love to hear you tell me just the 101s of mule riding, whatever comes to your mind, whatever you want to say, just the 101 of mule riding. Okay. Number one, don't ever offer me a green mule to ride and a well-broke horse. I will take the green mule just on his natural abilities just on his natural abilities from the donkey side to take care of him step, his steps, just in the natural ability of the donkey side to be careful and watch where he's going, just the natural ability of the donkey side not to overdrink and overeat. Can it happen? Yes, but it is rare. The natural abilities of that mule, whether it be a quarter horse mule whether it be a foxtrot or Tennessee walker, Pertron, whatever, the brains come from that donkey. That's what makes a good mule trainer, i.e., I got to point to Eric again. You know, he's, he's got a stud and he rides and he's ridden other donkeys. He's won contests. That's because you understand the donkey side of the mule. How do I know a lot of these guys are mostly on the horse side? Look at their halters. Just their halters alone, how they have them adjusted, that's one thing. And here's the pathetic part, where they have their saddles. They got the saddles clear up on the scapula. They don't have a rear cinch, or they have a rear cinch, and it's not tight. And they don't ride to breaching. Things like that are really, really important to the mule. So the other part is, when it comes down to these mules, how do you ride them? You basically ride them 80% off your legs, 20% off your hands. I like to leg cue. I barely will pick up my reins to move to the right or left. If I want to go to the right, I pick up my reins. That's a cue to the mule. He says, okay, what do you want, Steve? I take my left leg and I put it against the mule and we go to the right. Riding the mule is the most wonderful ride you can get. They're very lateral in their walking. They're very comfortable in their walking. Where do they get that? From the donkey side. Yes. Where they get their big round hips and their keen head and their body shape comes from the horse. Yes. And there's a lot of good qualities, but from the donkey side. I ride a mule because I love the way they think. I ride a mule because I like the way that they ride smooth, easy. Uh, they're awesome. I ride a mule because, like Max Johnson would say, he was that head packer at the Grand Canyon in the early 90s. He said, a mule give us life for you if he sees that you're a leader. So the follow-up question then that uh, Howard has, and I think I, think I know where you're going to go with this as well. Um, he said, we rode my mule today. She doesn't like it. Uh, she doesn't like it, what we do. Uh, what should we do so she will like the ride? I know that that's a loaded question, so where would we start and where would we go? 
Number one, we always start with the mechanical first. Go and get the teeth floated, number one. Number two, go get a chiropractor and make sure this mule's back is in the right place. You don't know if she's rolled down the side of a mountain. You don't know what kind of saddle they've used. You don't know if they've used a crouper and this sort of thing. Okay, now here's the question for him. How do you know she don't want to be rode? Is she throwing her head? Is she dropping her head? Is she twirling her tail? Tell me what she's doing that gets you to see that she's not happy about you riding. Yeah, that's a great question because as we talked in previous, um, let's see here, I'm trying to get the, there we go. As we've talked in previous live streams, uh, the signs that mules give you, the way that they communicate with you are, are different than anything else out there. And so what are the signs that they're giving you? Because that communicates something, that says something, that's giving you a, a heads up. And so being able to read those signs and understand what they mean, those are, those are two different things. You see it, but what does it actually mean? And, and uh, the way that I kind of think that this is so bizarre is I asked you, why do you say that, uh, you know, if the mule's doing this with his head or something like that, why do you say that that's related to the teeth? And you said, well, it's because you want to get the teeth floated and you want them to be all leveled off right there. And if, and if they're not all leveled off, they'll get caught. And if they get caught, it's putting that mule in pain. So that mule is altering its physique to accommodate for that pain. Like, well, that makes sense. So, uh, so there's the question then, Howard, what signs is she giving you that she doesn't want to be ridden? So we'll go ahead. We'll let you write. We'll let you uh, get back to that. And then we'll circle back around after this next Let's question. Touch on this a minute, yeah, Dave. go for it. Go for it. One of my clients calls me up and she says, Steve, I'm riding my mule and all of a sudden the mule drops to the ground. I said, really? How many times have you done that? Four or five times. How long have you had this mule? Oh, seven or eight years. I just come back from a ride in Death Valley days. I rode this mule over here. I rode this mule there. I said, send me a picture. She sent me a picture and guess what? She was riding the saddle on top of the scapula and she wasn't riding with a breeching. And I said, uh, and I said, the other thing is, I said, where's my saddle? She says, well, I thought I'd just try this saddle out. And I said, there's your answer to your question. <laughs> your mule is, has probably been telling you by shaking his head or elevating his head or dropping his head way down low or stepping to one side to get on, doing lots of things. And finally he says, look, hey, dummy, I've got to get your attention and I'm going to lay down. You're lucky that that mule was that nice and just didn't buck you off mm -hmm. and put you in ER. Mm -hmm. Or like some of my mules that people brought to me, they kicked the saddle out of your hand because they've had enough, you know. So I'll be interested to see what he's going to say about how does he know that mule is happy or unhappy. So what he came back to say is she's dropping her, she's dropping her head. Yeah. yeah. Send me a picture of where you're putting the saddle. Show me a, send me a picture of the saddle setting on the mule. If the mule is dropping her head, she's got two problems most likely, three probably. Number one, the teeth problem. So she, that's one. Two, it could be you got your saddle setting on top of the scapula. Three, the saddle, I mean the, the vertebrae are out of place. Again, because most people only tighten the front cinch. That's right on top of the sixth and seventh rib. Mule is trying to tell you here, I'm uncomfortable. So he uh, follows up and he says, Are, do we just scare the mule? Is that part of the problem? That's a possibility. How old is this mule? He hasn't said. Howard, how old is, uh, how old is the mule? And do you have any other background information on the mule that you'd like to share? While well, we're waiting for Howard to, uh, to answer that there, Tommy follows up with, can you explain floating the teeth? What is floating the teeth? This is a good one, Steve. Okay. Floating the teeth, if we go to a dentist, he's going to put what's called a speculum in the mouth. So he's going to give the mule first a shot to make it be quiet. And that's going to vary from dentist to dentist what they're going to use. Then they put a speculum inside the mouth, and then it opens up the mouth, and it holds the mouth open. And, and this machine holds it open, so then he can reach in there with a file, and he can file the teeth that are bad. There's going to be points. And then you can get back into the TMJs and he can file those. Now, we also are using today electrical files and we're, and we also use hand files. Both are good. 
The main thing is, is that we have correct bite. Now, you heard me talk about this last week. Take the lower jaw, the upper jaw, move it back and forth. If you hear a lot of scraping, yes, you better get your meal into the dentist. So we've seen that over and over where folks will come in and they'll say that they took them to the dentist and either the dentist floated the teeth or the dentist said, no, they're good. You don't need to do anything. Um, and then they'll get in front of you and you'll do that exact same thing. You'll, you'll take the, put your hand on top of the, on top of the nose there, put your hand over underneath the jaw and do exactly that. And it's this, it's this sound. It's kind of like a type sound. And, uh, and yeah. Every time I've seen that, you said, no, it's it's not bad right here, and it's it's a little bit better on this side, but no, it needs to be done. So Howard says, Howard came back and says, the mule is one year old. Oh, you shouldn't be on his back. you got to wait till that mule is two years and six months so that their knees are closed. And yes, you're scaring the mule, absolutely scaring the mule. Don't put a kid on them. Don't put a saddle on them. Just pick up their feet. Uh, and, uh, and, and lead them around, have them go across obstacles, have them trust you. Here's the problem. People say, well, I'll just put any old saddle on. Well, when you tighten up that front cinch and it puts pressure upon the sixth and seventh rib, why should that mule trust you? Period. So, yes, that mule needs to be two years and six months so that their knees are closed and you have that perfect cartilage on the knee. Is foundation cult starting a good place for him to to turn to with what he should be doing right now? No, I I wouldn't sit him there at all. I I would just tell him just to well, if he's going to do one, have him do problem meal building a new foundation with the uh, the meal ground uh, ground tra training kit that we have, yeah. and that'll show him how to do different things with the meal on the ground. Very good. So Howard, I'll put a link to that. So if you're looking to take next steps and you like the way that, you know, Steve's approach, you like what you're hearing here, that would probably be a great next step for you. And we put a kit together because we have so many folks who they, their mules need that foundation. They need that training. And this, this gives you exactly what you need. So uh, Andon uh, chimes in and Andon, I think this is the first question we've got from you. So welcome. So glad to have you. We're glad to have And Andon, aren't we, Steve? Yep, Absolutely. He says, I have a 12-year-old pack mule I've had for a few years, and she isn't trusting at all. She isn't mean or aggressive, but she just doesn't take to trusting people. What things can I do to build her trust so she relaxes when I'm handling her? Well, here's the, here's the thing. is It's the way her disposition is. She's got to just go get the work done and forget about being a pet. I'm not a pet. Just put me to work, get me to get my job done, I'm done. You cannot train disposition. Can't be done. Uh, you can give them carrots, you can give them treats, but that's, that's, that even giving them the carrots and treats is not going to change their disposition. So you're just going to have to keep her a pack and deal. She's not a fluffy paint, uh, uh, pet and mule. Uh, and that's what a lot of these pack and mules are. They could care less about being petted. They can care less about being around people. Just put the pack outfit on me, pack, pack out the elk, and we're done. So nothing that you can do? No. Is that no, because, it, is that because of the age? No. No, it, you, it's not age. It's just the way the mule was born, period. A lot of people think they've been abused. No, it's their disposition. A lot of people think, uh, think they can train it into them and make them love you. No, 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 you know. They're just flat, not going to be a pet mule, a, quote, family mule, whatever you want to call it. So that, that's the way we used to have mules. You know, when 20 years ago, you didn't want to be around a darn mule. Who would want to be around a mule? That's stubborn. They're ugly, yada, yada. We used to, when we wanted to get a mule, we saddled up our horses. We went out, and we roped the mule around the neck. We roped around the back legs. We spread him apart. We blindfolded him, we packed him. That's, that's the mules that we have. But today, these mules are better mules than that, you know. Um, but every once in a while, we have one like that, and it's not the way they've been trained. It's not the way they've been treated and abused. It's not that way. It is their disposition, you know. So can you breed for disposition? Well, you can, but the problem is uh, 
there are some mules that even though you bred them right and you've got the right disposition mare, right disposition jack, you'll have a disposition that says, Dave, I, I love you, but Steve, I don't want nothing to do with. And that happens. I was just talking with a guy today in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just got him a mule. Boy, they went on the internet and they found a mule. Eh, wrong answer. Then they had a friend go look at it and said, boy, nice mule. Eh, wrong answer. You know, and I told him, I told him, you know, made a lot of suggestions, but let's go on. Well, when he walks into the corral, the mule says, hey, how are you? How are you doing? When his wife works in the, walks in the corral, lady, go away and turns around and looks the other way. It happens, folks. You know, these are not, not puppy dogs. They're not kitty cats. These animals follow leadership. And if you drop your head and look up, you just ask for permission to be in their herd. And this mule that he has, uh, uh, I've had <laughs> and trained a lot of them. And there's no, no fixing or, or training disposition. You know, just pack that mule and he'll be happy. And in, uh, writes back in and says, I'm watching from Wyoming. Thanks. And that's the kind of approach I've had with her is to just put her to work. So sounds like you're on the right track there, Andon. Yep. I'm going to be in Gillette, Wyoming here in about two weeks hunting turkey. That'll be great. That'll be oh, great. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so Howard comes back with what so kind of saddle do we use? Howard, I went ahead and if you look in the comment section, I linked to, let me see here. I linked to a YouTube uh, playlist where we have five awesome videos on understanding saddles for mules and donkeys. And there's way more detail in those videos than what we would be able to get into here. So go into the comment section, click on that link. Um, there's about, I don't know, there's about 30 or 40 minutes worth of video, uh, absolutely free that you can watch. Um, I can tell you the number one thing is you want to have a mule saddle. Now, Steve now says you want to have one of Steve's saddles because the bars that are on Steve's saddles are different. Uh, these these uh, saddle manufacturers, they realize that there's a market, and so they just take a, a regular quarter horse saddle, and they say it's got mule bars, and they sell it. Well, that's really not the case. And if you see some of these mules and some of the scalding that happens and some of the white hairs that are coming up underneath the shoulder where that scapula uh, keeps hitting the saddle, you're going to see that a mule saddle, just because it says mule, isn't a mule saddle. What you really want to do is you, am I, am I echoing you, Steve? Am I, am yeah, I? Yeah. It, it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, where people make mistakes, they hold on the horn. It's in the video. They hold on the horn, they hold on to the, to the candle, and they rock it back and forth. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to tell you, you know, any saddle is going to rock back and forth when you have your hand on the horn, hand on the candle, because of the fat pocket, number one, that's on the mule. And the other thing, because there's a little bit of an arch to it, you know, so it's going to rock. And so, but if you take my saddle, you put your hand where you sit, you'll see that the front of the saddle will come up. Dave, you've seen it. Yeah. And there's no pressure in that scapula area. You do not want the whole bar to be fit and flush. That scapula has to move, and the area behind the scapula has to move. It's, it's the biggest question that I have in any of my clinics. Yeah. Biggest question. Yeah, folks want to know all about the saddle. So, Howard, check out that YouTube playlist. I put that together just in the last week specifically for questions like yours. Thank you so much for bringing those questions. Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, Kevin has a uh, has a follow-up question here. He says, I have a smaller mule, about 13.2 short, uh, short coupled. She's probably weighs 650 to 700 pounds. What kind of body weight can she carry? Oh, that's going to be tough, buddy. It's going to depend on a lot of things. Number one, her condition, what kind of condition there is. And that's really important. I have seen big old 16-hand mules at the Grand Canyon uh, that couldn't handle uh, the weight, weight of people uh, until they got conditioned. It's just like you and I, we put a pack outfit on our backs. It takes a while to condition. But I can tell you that my best friend, who weighed at that time around 240 pounds, he rode a 14-2 uh, mule that we call Beaner. He was a paint mule. And um, Pinto, so therefore the ben, the Beaner, and he rode that mule for 15 years, and that was a small mule. 
So can he handle most of the time? Yes, they can handle you. The big thing is, is like I was showing in my last clinic, every time you ride, just like checking the tires on your truck before you go on a trip, so you check the air in them, you make sure everything's just right on your trip. On these meals, you move the hands on the tendons, make sure that tendon is tight from the top to the bottom at every single ride. Awesome. So uh, let's see here. Uh, Yolanda from uh, the Netherlands chimes in. Hi, Yolanda. Good it's to Yolanda. have you. Hey, yep. <laughs> glad to be wa glad you're watching, especially with the time difference. We're very, very yeah. privileged. We appreciate that. So the next wow. question uh, that I have that I just want to put out there to folks, I really would love to hear what folks um, have to say about this. Is um, are you have you been to any clinics this year that you've absolutely loved? Clinics or expos, or are you planning on going to any clinics? or expos this year. So please take a second in the comment section, just say where you've been and what the clinic was or, or what the expo was. We'd love to hear what awesome experiences are happening out there. We know the ones that Steve's going to, we know the ones that Steve's hosting, but we know that there's so much more happening out there and we would just love to hear. So please, right now, you're listening, you're cooking dinner, you're taking care of the kids, you're doing whatever, just take a moment, type in, whether it's on your computer or on your smartphone and just say, what clinics or expos have you gone to or are you going to in 2018 that you're that you're just excited about or just fantastic experiences? So while folks are doing that, we'll hop to the next question here. Uh, the next question is, um, can you talk a little bit about approaching your mule from the left side? Um, I have someone who said, let's see, it Rock, Rock in Rosies says uh, um, she watched a video where we had the uh, the owners in the uh, in the pen, and they were and she was approaching the mule. If you remember, and you would say, "Okay, now step to your left, step to your left," and we were tr trying to get her timing correct. Um, are you having her approach the mule in this way because the mule is untrained, or because she doesn't know her and is approaching the mule the way that that owner was doing? Is that something you need to do every time? Forgive me if this is a stupid question. No stupid questions here. No. Smart questions. No. Do you know which video I'm talking about, Steve? Yes, absolutely. And, and it's, you know, what I do with people all the time. Here's the thing. I'm watching the mule, and I'm reading the mule. I watch his nose. If Now, I'm on the right-hand side, and when the mule's nose looks to the left, I then step to the left. And when I step, the mule's going to look at me like, well, why did you move? What I'm doing when I step to the left or when I have – First step left, I'm asking the mule, come back, watch me, listen to me. And eventually, as I step to the left, the mule's hind end comes around and follows me around and then eventually goes. So basically what I was doing was when the mule put me on ignore and was looking to her left, when I stepped to my left, that made the mule look and that was what I wanted. Come back, listen to me. Um, that video is one, and then that uh, how to communicate video that I've got was one that was hard to catch in a round pin. You know? Very good. So that's a helpful one. I'm going to make sure to go back to YouTube and uh, link to this particular video so that she gets that answer there and she understands a little bit more. I love seeing this. Steve, you're going to love this too. So um, Howard's been asking questions about you know saddle and the mule and things like that. Uh, Kevin and Kevin just chimed back in. He says, Howard, I went through the same the the same saddle thing uh, till I met Steve. I have two of his trail light and uh, the cowboy and love them. So there's a little bit of an endorsement there. But I just love seeing folks help one another and share one another's experience because that's the, the truth is, is that, um, you know, we're here every day on Facebook. But there are folks all over the place beyond just Steve who can share experiences, share advice. And as long as they're getting the right foundation, man, it's awesome to see this this community grow and help one another. Um, so let's see here. Uh, Anna Curry just chimed in. Uh, she So hi, Anna. Glad to hear you. Or glad to see you. Glad to have you here. Uh, and Karen Linder Whitehead just chimed in too. Uh, both of them are sharing a couple uh, expos. She says, I'm looking forward to the Cal Expo in Sacramento. Last year you had to cancel. Are you planning on attending this year? Have you heard from them, Steve? I, I don't have an invitation this year. Uh, last year I had my hip had got infected yep. on me, and so I was down there. But, folks, what helps us clinicians, not just me, but any of the clinicians, 
If you dislike them, let them let the expos know. If you like them, let the expos know. They need to know who people really like. Now, don't get me wrong. I can't make everybody happy, and neither can the other clinicians, all right? There's always going to be somebody that says, my hat's on Roan or something, you know. So don't worry about it. But please, uh, contact the, the expos and say, hey, invite Steve back, and Steve will be there. Yeah, there you go. That is the best way to do it. They want to hear from you. They want to yeah. know who the people attending want to see. That's the stuff that they value, bottom dollar. Uh, most thing is who the people attending want to see. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Anna says that she's never been to an expo or a clinic, but she would like to because it would add more information to the equine science. Anyways, her question is, can mules be housed and pastured with dehorned cattle? Just curious in case I ever own some. Dehorned cattle? Cattle. Yeah, there you go. Okay, cattle. Okay, good. Uh, you know, um, Mules do fine with adult cattle. It's when we have babies, they tend to mother up to the baby and keep the cow away and end up starving the baby. And I've also had mules actually kill cattle, uh, calves. Uh, but for the most part, uh, uh, we've had our mules turn loose out in the pasture with, with uh, bulls and with cows and they've done fine uh, without any problem at all. You just gotta remember, that uh, especially if it's a bull, he can get quite cranky at times. Um, so uh, the next question that, thank you, Anna, appreciate that. The next question that comes in, Yolanda asks, Steve, uh, will the cowboy saddle fit my Spanish mule? And, mu must, and what must I know to, what must I do to know if it will fit because of the distance? Now, I think we talked a little bit about this last week. Steve, can you just rehash real quick what you had to say about the Spanish mules last week? Well, you know, basically the Spanish mules, uh, you know, they still got a donkey, and the donkey is the bone structure that I use to fit my mules. I have put saddles on mules all over the world. Uh, so, you know, you, you'll have people that say, well, give me the measurements. Well, if I give you measurements, if you give me measurements in January, when the mule is going through the winter and set and, and fat and laying around, and that's going to be one measurement. And then if we measure that mule again, say July or August, when he's been ridden and he's toughened up, you're going to have a different measurement. And besides that, just in one, in one uh, trail ride on a weekend, you can lose 100 pounds. So we used to add blankets to make up for the shrinkage. Well, I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, my... You know, my saddles fit. Uh, as you see, looking through the internet, you see all kinds of people, uh, every kind of mule. I'm not sure exactly, uh, you know, the, the Spanish end of it, why, if they're using a paso or a paso fino or what the breed is behind it. Uh, but it's, you know, basically if we look at it, we see the donkey feet, we see the donkey head, and the donkey bone structure is what we go by, whether you call it Quarter horse or Pertron, it's still got the donkey side. So there you go, Yolanda. You can you can uh, get you can saddle in confidence is what I'm trying to say. You can saddle in confidence knowing that the saddle is not fit, meant to fit a particular mule or a particular donkey, but it's meant to fit that bone structure, and that's the most important thing. Uh, Steve's had plenty of people. We've had plenty of people say, "Oh, I had a custom saddle made just for my horse." And which is great until that horse or that mule or that donkey or whoever is is gone. Now you have a saddle that you can't use. The great thing about what Steve's done is over the last you know 40 years really learned that, hey, it's the bone structure that matter, matters uh, a lot less than maybe this particular breed or this particular, you know, you know, type of mule or whatnot. It's that bone structure that matters. So um, the next question that we have here is um, my donkey puts his head down when I ride him. I have a four-year-old donkey, and when I ride him, he always puts his nose almost to the ground. I'm not sure why. I have all of Steve's tech, and I make sure it doesn't interfere with the shoulders. He's trying to tell me something, but I'm not sure what. I cannot ride him this way. Do you have any thoughts? Well, of course, my first thought is, you know, you've done the dental work, and that's done. You've done the chiropractic work, and that's done. It could be that some of these, I've had donkeys do that, 
they have to build up their confidence. And I've had some of them go a long time uh, and do this. So what I usually do is I take my hands on the reins on the snaffle bit, and I take and I bump right, left, right, left, and I pull, I bump up. And I make their nose being down uncomfortable. So I see it as two things. One, it can be that the that the mule is uh, evading you, and that's the way he can do it. The other one, it could be his loss loss of confidence. Uh, so which can happen. Now, a little test: when the when the mule has a rider on it, does he put his head down? When the mule doesn't have a rider on it, and you lead it, doesn't put his head down. So. Uh, I've seen it both ways. I see it when I put a small rider on, on the donkey's back, he's comfortable with that. When you put a bigger rider on the donkey's back, he's uncomfortable with that and he drops his head. So I'd almost have to see it in motion, but there's some thoughts for you. So I went and I found, he sent this in on Facebook and, and I did not see this until just now. After I grabbed the question and I put it in my list, he wrote uh, back, he said, I had a vet check the teeth for point and there weren't any. He doesn't have wolf's teeth. I can saddle him and send you picks. We'll definitely want that. Um, not sure why he keeps his head so low. It's almost like he's sniffing the ground. He is really pulling. Uh, he is he it, he is really pulling, he, but head super low. Um, I have to keep pulling his head up. Um, and then I think this is unrelated, but I'll just read it anyways. He goes, I purchased a double twisted snaffle from Steve. I have a thin four-year-old donkey, and it appears too large for him. It sticks out the sides of the mouth. Are there different sizes? I have saddle pad, britchin, uh, berths, and the training double twisted snaffle bit. Um, when I got the bit, I didn't really ask for size. So I, we already talked about sizing for a bit, so I'll go back to that. And it sounds like the rest of this is unrelated. But yeah, yeah uh, about the teeth. Doesn't have wolf teeth, so I can saddle them. I think we're just going to want pictures, yeah? Yeah, I want pictures. But the other thing, remember a snaffle bit can be this long, and then when you pull on the sides, it can be shorter. So it makes no difference really how it's setting in here unless it's real long. I mean, if it's sticking out an inch on each side, that's different. If it's sticking out, uh, oh, maybe like a, a quarter inch mm -hmm. to maybe a half at the most, that's okay. Uh, but it's the big thing is their lips. But go back. Uh, did the vet actually float the teeth or did he say they were okay? So that would bother me. These vets all the time are saying, well, he'll be fine. Take that upper and lower, move it back and forth and listen for yourself. I can't tell you how many people have told me their vets said they were fine and they were not. You know? Yeah, that's one of those things that we continually see. You know, I already talked about that. I could say it again, but it's just the exact same thing. We see that a lot of times. Um, Howard asked this question. He's, he's wanting to know about this mule. He says, I typically ride horses. So he's wanting to get informed, and I applaud that. He says, do we just go ahead and baby the mule? It's that one-year-old. Okay, that's that yearling? Yeah. Yeah. Baby I don't call it babying. I call it building a foundation. But lead him around uh, with a with come-along hitch, pick up all four feet, set you up an area to where you can take the, 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 the mule over, a, over tires, Take the mule over top of a piece of plywood. You can do a lot of different things with them uh, and lead them across. Let them build their confidence. It's not that you're desensitizing them. You're getting them to be able to have confidence and respect for you in the, in the end of the lead rope and confidence and respect on the halter. So you, you've got about another year and a half before it's time to ride. In the meantime, foundational training. Good stuff. The next question I have is uh, tips for round pin or square pin training. So we had um, we had some conversation going back and forth on YouTube. Uh, one person was asking questions about uh, you know how to how to you know do the things that you're doing in the in the pen, but when you don't have a pen. And so um, so KK says a tip for square pin training. Uh, to get them to stop hiding in the corner, add some fence or coral panels in the corners, and it keeps them from stopping there. Uh, for one that is fairly broke, I have put two by fours to the bridge that corners the places. Um, also, a tip a friend showed, and this is where the question is for horses, is to create a little path for them with some logs or poles. Would that help at all for mules? I've only tried it on about five. 
Well, it, it would help, but it's hard because they find that corner and they say, okay, I disappeared. Ostrich in his head in the sand type thing. Uh, that's why the round pin. The round pin, they can't hide. They have to focus on you. Um, it, it's really difficult. I don't use a round pin like everybody else. I don't move them around a lot. I use it for getting them to fill their first saddle. I get it to have where it's where I can catch them if they're hard to catch. But I don't put a mule in a round pen and run him around. It's it's a mindless effort for mules and donkeys. So um, here's a question that came in, and this one is about uh, pack saddles. And it's just basically, can you talk a little bit about proper pack saddle adjustment? Things that need to that we need to know about pack saddles. Well. Pack saddles, matter of fact, I've got uh, some, some pictures on it from a guy in Wyoming. And uh, you want to have the saddle back behind the scapula, so it's two inches behind the scapula. Uh, make sure you have the rear cinch tighter than the front cinch, just like a riding saddle. But always put the saddle on the mule's back. See, you, there's no wool, and there's no skirting. So you can put the saddle on the mule's back and see if it actually fits. And when you push it forward, is it hitting the scapula? And the the uh, the pictures that we're going to be having uh, that I sent you, Dave, on that guy with the, the pack saddle on, he kept having all the, the problems. When we put mm -hmm. that up on Facebook, uh, that'll be an answer for people. You know? Very uh, good. My video uh, on packing is really good about talking about saddle placement and this sort of thing. There's, there's three DVDs there. I'll put a link to that, so if that's something that they want to check out a little bit further, they can. Um, so Yolanda uh, chimes back in, and she says, my mule is Spanish, bit trained, and does not accept a snaffle at all. Um, she does not know what that is, but is it possible to learn them to respond to a snaffle? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a snaffle bit <clears throat> builds a foundation, and actually it's what it, it, they'll learn, no problem. Awesome. Let's see here. I think uh, one thing that I wanted to do is Michelle from Facebook uh, sent a message and said, just wanted to say thank you for all of your information on donkeys. I've purchased my first ever donkey and he should be coming home in about a month. So I am looking at all sorts of videos on YouTube to be better prepared. So I love hearing that folks getting educated before they go out and make that purchase rather than, you know, being on the hook for a lot of money for a, a sorry mule or a sorry donkey. Yeah, boy. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the last question, and this is one that I would just love to put out to everybody who's still watching. We got 19 people still watching hey, up here, <laughs> hanging out with us. We love it. Um, the last question that I really want to know, and I want to read them here to you, Steve, is I just want to know how often people are riding, how often they're getting out, how often they're spending time in the saddle, and you know, where's their favorite place to go? I know for you. Um, of course, you don't have any mules there on the ranch right now, but when, when you do have them, your whole backyard is, it, it is, it is riding territory, right? 90, 90 square miles of backyard. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Folks, uh, we're doing another clinic out on, um, out on the ranch, uh, May 19th and 20th. And I'll tell you what, one of my favorite places in the entire world is on the back patio, eating lunch, just looking at the backyard. Because that backyard, is, it's fantastic. It's absolutely gorgeous. Let's see here. While folks are answering that, we'll take, a, we'll take time to do a couple more questions. And then we'll hear where folks, how often they're riding and where they like to ride. We have a question, first question from Sue Callahan. She says, we picked up a little half finger mule that bolts. My daughter has been working with her in a round pin teaching her to give her the bit um, and working on neck reining and leg pressure. The mule has bolted on her twice. Can, can we be doing, what can we be doing to stop this? I, uh, I, I just finished an article on bolting. I'll send it to you, Dave. Okay. Uh, and, and, and we can turn around and send that to Sue. Here's the thing. They bolt because something is not right. Yeah, it could be they bolted because the saddle hit the scapula. It could be they're bolted because their teeth aren't done. You know, uh, don't get out there and throw a bunch of stuff around and desensitize him, thinking the best thing you can do with this mule is not ride him, but put a sur single on him, hook up the mule rider's martingale, turn him loose in a round pin, 
and let him get soft in the face so that that mule does not have respect for the bit. And that's the biggest thing. So that, get the mechanical out of the way, the teeth, the chiropractic. I know Sue's got my saddle, so that's not a problem, okay? So get those out of the way and then start surcingling. Don't be riding. Get them get soft in the face. Nose on the vertical, balance. Top of the hip, top of the wither, top of the hip, balance. So there's some foundational stuff that you can be doing there. And uh, and she followed up just asking, what's the cost for the clinic? Sue, it's $150 a day to be a participant, and it's $50 a day to be a spectator. It is, it is, it is the best value you are going to get. Uh, on any type of training. It is it's just amazing how much we're able to cover when we're out there and and um I'll I'll tell you what. I I'm not a mule person, right? So I'm out there to capture on video to continue to learn, to be able to ask good questions, things like that. But the the people that come out there, they are mule and donkey people or they're new to mule and donkey world and and their their experiences let us know that we need to continue to do it. So if you're interested in coming out, I highly recommend it. If you can bring your animal and be a participant, that would be fantastic. But just to be a spectator is amazing as well. Steve, you want to talk a little bit about trail riding with confidence before we close up here? You bet. Now, Sue, Sue was uh, actually, I used her in some training in one of my clinics in Camp Verde. Oh, no kidding. I, yeah, I showed her a lot of different things. I showed her the problems that she was having with her saddle and this sort of thing. She's also a sheriff's deputy up in uh, up by Kingman area, uh, but and she's really become a mule gal I mean, almost overnight and got a couple of beautiful mules. But uh, the trail riding with confidence is a, is a awesome clinic. But I remember, folks, I only limit these clinics to ten people. I don't care about having a bunch of people there. And it's one-on-one. -on -one. I spend a lot of time with you. I may, uh, I may uh, teach one thing, but it's to help everyone. So everybody tries it. But I, I'm there to help you. That's the reason we do these things. Yeah, it's, it's been so much fun doing them. I had a blast at the last one. We'll do one final question, then we'll call it a day. Uh, Lynn writes in, and Lynn, thank you so much for, for tuning in. I'm so glad we could get to this one for you. Do you always use a sur single before taking a mule out on the trail? I have a 15-year-old hasn't been on a trail for at least 10 years. What would be your uh, what would be your your thoughts to to um, uh, to Lynn there? Tune-ups. Everybody's got to have a tune-up on their car, their lawnmower, their boat, their everything. Tune-ups to get them ready for the season. And also, they just flat just like any other car. They need to be tuned up with different things. Same thing with this mule. With my wife's mule, 28 years old when she passed away, world champion, Arizona State champion, she was as solid as you can get, this mule. I sur singled that mule two to three times a month. Put the sur single on, put the bridle on, let her pick it up and carry it. That puts a nice mind on them. That gets them, gets their nose on the vertical. And you don't have to be in the saddle to do it. Because what you want them to do is respect that bit or respect that halter. And that's where the surf singling comes in. Awesome. Cool. Well, that's all the questions that we have for today. I hope everyone enjoyed the broadcast. I had uh, I had Tommy, um, let's see. No, it was John. I had John um, write in and he said, uh, he said, hey, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Steve, for all the time to help us learn. I don't believe other trainers are doing this, especially not for free. So this is a joy for us. We we love yeah. doing this. This is a lot of fun. So so we'll continue doing it as long as folks continue watching, as long as questions keep coming in. So if the questions stop, then we have nothing to talk about. But as long as you guys have questions, keep sending them in. We will get to them. And if we don't get to them you know, immediately, we will make sure that we address them at some point in time. And you can get in touch with us on um, Facebook, too. You can send a message on Facebook. Always feel free to st send Steve an email, steve at muleranch.com, and chances are you'll probably wind up on the phone with him and having a conversation. Steve, that's it for today. Thanks so yeah. much for uh, for hanging out. Um, you got some. You have some, uh, some training to do this afternoon, this evening, don't you? Yeah, I'm going to take my Border Collie puppy, Jess, Oh, Jesse and I are going to go out with Susan, and I'm going to work the sheep and do the 
that part of it. And then Susan takes them over and she does the agility. And Jess was just out herding butterflies a few minutes ago uh, before I come in. He, uh, he, he sees all these butterflies going over. He's trying to get them cornered in one corner. He runs here, runs there. Of course. Uh, he just, anything he can herd, he'll do it, you know. And butterflies, now that is, that is cool, you know. He's That's awesome. True. That's fantastic. Folks, thanks for hanging out. We will be in touch. Be sure to check out Steve on Facebook. We're on Instagram now as well. Um, if you miss any of the live streams, you can always find us on YouTube. I'll go ahead and I'll put a link in the comment section here to, uh, to the YouTube channel. There's lots and lots and lots of free training there, amazing training. Um, some of it is pulled from Steve's instructional videos on the website. Some of it is stuff that we just recorded straight up specifically for YouTube. It's all there for the taking. Uh, be sure to mention this live stream and share the resources with friends and family who are in the mule and donkey community. They're going to love it. If you don't share it, they're probably not going to find it. Your connection uh, to this community is, is far greater than ours. Is, so we really count on you uh, to be sharing it with friends and family. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. We'll talk soon. You betcha. Hey, thanks, everybody. Have a good one.